I'll be uh, speaking in Spanish, but I'll have it later. So, um,
The approach to the programs we, hear, we have here at the university is practical in nature. And the objective is to train translators and interpreters. In order to be recognized, in order for our profession to be recognized at a social level, we need to have academic discipline. And this academic discipline, and for this academic discipline, we also need to have research. I hope that this lecture series of Found in Translation shows that the translation and interpreting studies are interdisciplinary and broad. For example, we have studies that look at uh, translation and interpreting studies uh, from a historical point of view, and this is the focus of history of translation. We also have studies that analyze the social conditions of translation and interpreting, and how this actually affects our practice, and this is the focus of sociology of translation. And we also have studies that focus on the translation and interpreting processes. And this helps us uh, develop new teaching uh, techniques and to improve the working conditions for translators and interpreters. In addition to the body of knowledge that we can obtain from these, this research, I would also like to say that translate, translation and interpreting studies give our profession legitimacy. And if we want to maintain this privileged position, uh, we need to continue to promote research, and this is the main objective of this lecture series. Este otoño tendremos tres, uh, en, en el marco de, de Fan Translation, tendremos tres ponencias. La primera uh, tendrá lugar hoy y la presentará la profesora Edith Johnson, que le dirá algo en unos minutos. La, el 4 de octubre, en el mismo lugar y a la misma hora, tendremos una ponencia que la presentará eh, Ken Johansson, que hablará sobre cómo la traducción en el eh, Parlamento Europeo hace posible una democracia multilingüe. Y el 1 de octubre o el 1 de octubre eh, tendremos a la profesora Gómez, eh, Martínez Gómez Gómez, que nos hablará sobre interpretación comunitaria, en concreto sobre interpretación comunitaria en el contexto penitenciario. Eh, tengo pues el placer de presentar a la profesora Kirk Johnson, que hablará, o cuya presentación se titulará Mental Conditioning for Interpreters. La presentación durará aproximadamente una hora, más o menos, y después tendremos, tendremos unos 20 minutos para, para hacerle eh, preguntas. Eh, solo que rápidamente diré algunas palabras sobre la profesora Johnson, aunque la mayoría de los que estamos aquí la conocemos bastante bien. Eh, la profesora Johnson es, no, es, es profesora asociada del instituto, da clases de traducción del inglés al francés y clases de interpretación. También enseña en segundo año, todos los estudiantes la tendrán en segundo, eh, la asignatura traducción e interpretación como profesión. Eh, el, el, la investigación que va a presentar hoy es parte de su proyecto doctoral, eh, que está realizando un doctorado en, en pedagogía en la Universidad de San Francisco. Y eh, bueno, su vida profesional es muy activa, es, una, es, es una, alguien muy reconocido en el campo como un eh, intérprete de conferencias, también ha traducido varios libros, pero no voy a decir más porque no quiero robar más tiempo de, de su presentación. Así que sin más, le cedo la palabra a Ingrid y agradezco por haber aceptado la invitación de venir a hablar a hoy. This fall we will have three speakers with us, and today uh, Professor Julie Johnson will be the first of those speakers. We will have also a conference on October 4th, and it will be at the same time and at the same place. And this presentation will be given by Ken Johansson, who will talk about translation in the European Parliament and how this makes a multilingual democracy possible. And the third presentation will be on November 1st, uh, and it will be given by Professor Martinez Gomez Gomez, who will talk about community interpreting in prison settings. So it is my pleasure to present Professor Julie Johnson, who will be talking today about mental conditioning for interpreters. The lecture will last approximately one hour, and then we will have a round of questions that will last uh, more or less 20 minutes. 
So I'm going to talk briefly about Professor Julie Johnson, but I'm sure most of you already know who she is. She is an associate professor here at MISS and teaches translation and interpretation from English into French. And uh, she also teaches second year classes, uh, in this case, translation and interpretation as a profession. Uh, the presentation we'll see, that we will see today is part of her doctorate in education that she is pursuing at the University of San Francisco. She's a very active person professionally and is very well known. Uh, she also gives, uh, she also participates as an interpreter in conferences. And well, I will stop there and I won't uh, talk any more about her since uh, I need to have more time for the presentation. But I want to thank her very much for accepting this invitation to talk to us today about her work. Thank you, Madam Minister, for the introduction, and thank you especially for all of the effort that you've been putting in to organize this series. Really appreciate it, and thank you, Jacqueline, also for and Laura, who I think needed to take off, for helping to organize the interpreter for this. And thank you to all of our interpreters for being here. And uh, I hope it's not too wild a variety. Um, I tend to be fairly extemporaneous um, as a speaker. With that, I'd like to say that um, I really appreciate all of you being here um, because um, this is actually the first time that I have publicly talked about my research that I'm undertaking. So it's fairly preliminary at this stage, and so consider it sort of an advanced screening, and that goes for some of the materials that I'll be showing you today as well. So here's where I'd like to start. Um, in interpreting studies, and even before in interpreting studies, it was an early belief that interpreters were born, not made. But as interpreter edu education took off in the 20th century, this notion was reversed. With effective training, you can learn to be a good interpreter. That's the good news. But the bad news is that learning to be an interpreter is really hard work. Today, we'll be looking at some of the lesser considered but fundamental challenges in interpreting. And more importantly, what to do about those challenges. Research findings from multiple domains of cognitive psychology provide insights that can smooth the path and also lay a foundation for optimal performance and for improvement throughout one's career. But so, why cognitive psychology? <coughs> cognitive psychology because interpreters are often conceived of as a neutral black box. The message goes in, goes through some kind of objective linguistic algorithm, and magically, out it comes on the other side in another language. It doesn't matter who the interpreter is, what the process is just the process. But the truth is that the message is interpreted, but the message interpreted is the message as perceived and as understood by a real person. Depending on what he or she knows, and has experienced. So, for example, if you talk to me about electrical engineering, I, I might as well be speaking in Urdu, right, with the person might be. I don't understand a thing about it. The message interpreted, or not, also depends on the interpreter's emotional state. Fear and self-consciousness can cause a complete mental block. By definition, Interpreting is a highly complex task that requires all sorts of knowledge, skills, <coughs> abilities, and personal qualities. So let's take a closer look at what interpreting studies has to say about what those are, especially as they relate, well, both to consecutive and simultaneous interpreting. The challenges are a bit different for each. So first of all, knowledge. Different kinds of knowledge include a mastery of languages, general background knowledge, and also analytical skills, 
such as the ability to recognize a line of reasoning and construct a cogent argument oneself. As you're probably painfully aware, these are among the things that we test for on the early diagnostic test that those of you who are students here had to take to get in here. Um, and all of these aspects of knowledge you continue to work on here in your courses through the different topics that are assigned, through practice, and through feedback. A third area of knowledge is actually knowledge acquisition. This is a skill, actually, learning how to acquire the knowledge that you need for each of the new topics you encounter um, in, for your different interpreting assignments. So this includes assignment preparation, such as background reading or viewing of videos and whatnot, identifying and understanding the concepts involved, learning the terminology in the source language and in the target language, developing, taking shortcuts and symbols, abbreviations, and so on. And these are all among the things that we teach in interpreting classes, especially at the advanced level. Daniel Xu, one of the premier researchers in our field, said back in 1997 that in his article, Conference Interpreting as a Cognitive Management Problem, that the cognitive tasks involved in interpreting are intrinsically difficult, much more difficult than everyday communication. They require a habit of fully exploiting one's cognitive resources. So, what are those cognitive tasks involved in interpreting? As you know really well now, they include, first of all, listening, knowing how to listen for ideas and their interconnections, and not just the words. It involves memory, using <coughs> your memory and the support of your notes to recall what was said. And it involves production and with a clear idiomatic delivery. Some of you might recognize these three, three things, listening, memory, and production, as what you identified as the three major efforts in the effort model of interpreting. But let's get underneath those a little bit further and talk about another set of sub-skills, cognitive skills. One thing is that we need to temporarily construct large new contexts. That is, on the fly, we need to construct mental models or schema of someone else's reality as we're listening, understanding what their world is, what it is that they're describing from inside their brain. We need to get inside their thought process. Imagine, I mean, it's hard enough keeping your own thoughts straight, right? But just there in the moment, we need to immerse ourselves in someone else's mental reality. Secondly, we need to be able to circumvent the limitations of short-term memory because short-term memory is really, really small, as you probably have also painfully experienced. We can only hold about seven bits of information. So you wonder, well, how do we interpret anything at all? Because just in this last sentence, I've said had about seven bits of information, right? So if you could do it consecutive, how the heck did she go on for three, four, five minutes, right? How we do that is through all of the things that you're learning in consecutive class, chunking, visualizing, outlining, mapping what we hear onto our existing understanding of the topic, associating the ideas with our own experience. This is how we remember, and this is how we put, put lots of different things into packages so that each package becomes one chunk, and that way we can really stuff our short-term memory because little elements, a consex symbol, brings back a whole segment of discourse. That's how we manage to do it. Another cognitive skill that we use is filtering, right? Knowing what to pay attention to and what to leave aside, what to know and how to know it. Also, we need the ability to recreate the intentionality 
of a third party, idiomatically, in one's own discourse in the target language. So someone has expressed an idea one way in their language, and we need to somehow take all of that lump of clay and reform it, given in our own words, in the words that we have to use in our own language, right? Language in terms of French, English, Spanish, whatever, but also our personal language, what we have at our disposal. Also, it involves professional behavior, tact, discretion, poise, confidentiality. These things should all sound familiar. They're all of the things that we teach and learn in our interpreting classes. But I invite you now to go even still further. Look at this set. The highly complex kind of listening and cognitive processing we have to do for interpreting assumes that we have developed to an exceptional degree certain underlying abilities, such as the ability to focus our attention, to sustain that attention, to sustain that focus, to manage distractors, be they external distractors or internal distractors. External distractors would include noise, movements in the room, multiple voices at once, someone coughing, what have you. Also, it can be really distracting, for instance, if suddenly we don't know what's going on, someone new enters the room. It also requires what cognitive psychologists call situational awareness. Perceiving and understanding what's going on around us. What others are meaning to say. Why they're saying it the way they are what they're implying but not saying, what hidden agendas may lay behind their words, the power dynamics at play, and also anticipation, anticipating what might be said next, what might happen next. All of that requires very keen situational awareness. So, that's on the cognitive side. But some of the underlying abilities that enable us to perform interpreting tasks, well, are more on the affective side than the cognitive. I would include in this category the ability to regulate internal distractors, such as performance anxiety, self-consciousness, frustration, fear of failure, all of these things, even, the, I just named kind of negative things, but positive feelings can also be distractors. The minute you're not focusing on the speaker but thinking, hey, I'm pretty, doing pretty dang well, look at me, I'm flying high, I'm doing so good, I'm keeping up right with the speaker, as soon as your attention is off the speaker and I'll do, woohoo, I feel so good. Uh-oh, you're liable to crash, right? So those internal distractors are not necessarily all negative. They can also be positive. We also need to be able to remain calm and focused in the public eye. Think of yourself as an elite basketball player. Right? You've got a whole arena of people watching you and the entire world. I recently saw a clip of the team of the Women's World Cup. Right? The whole dang world was watching them. My, one of my professors at USF showed us this clip. It was a hoot of these soldiers, I don't know where they were, Afghanistan or someplace, with all, you don't see the screen they're watching, you just see the soldiers. And they're watching the Women's World Cup. And here's this room full of men in their fatigues going, yeah, when the girls made a uh, goal. In fact, they even raised one of the guys up and 
it made him body float, you know, through the crowd. The whole world was watching. But those women needed to be 100% focused on what they were doing, even though the whole world was watching. So it's this amazing ability that we need to develop of being able to be in the public eye, standing next to Hillary Clinton like Laura has done, knowing all the cameras are on you, and yet in that place, occupying a very private space where nothing distracts you and you're doing the task at hand. Interpreting, especially in consecutive, also requires situational management which can be defined as sensitivity to com communicative needs and interactional dynamics. That's by Franz Pohacker, another great researcher in our field. For example, we need to be able to manage stressful and unpredictable situations. We need to be adaptable. We need to navigate power dynamics, handle other people's idiosyncrasies and displays of emotion. Also, we often need to handle what's been uh, termed role overload and role ambiguities. For example, it's rarely entirely clear what the interpreter is to do. Often we're expected to do more than is objectively possible. For example, interpret multiple voices at once, go on for hours. And also we have to cope with role ambiguity within the constraints of relative power, the relative power of the interpreter and the perceived hierarchy of obligations to different parties in the interaction. Any of you who've done court interpreting know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. People have all sorts of assumptions about where your allegiance, allegiances lie, and they need to feel that they can trust you, and yet at the same time you're a neutral officer of the court. There's often a lot of ambiguity around those expectations. So if you combine all of the knowledge and skills and personal qualities that I've just outlined, you'd have a pretty good sketch of an expert interpreter at work. We're all somewhere along that continuum of expertise. If you're just starting out, such expertise might sound or feel like a distant dream. But you've probably had little moments, little tastes of it nevertheless. If you've been working for a while as an interpreter, then you've been out there and embodied that expertise more often. So, let's see how some interpreters describe their experience interpreting. Now, we're going to give this a try. Unfortunately, I don't know what's going on with our lecture hall, but couldn't get the sound to go through the system, so we're going to do um, a Jimmy rigged solution here so you can get uh, the sound. Let's see if we can do this. So, some very brave souls allowed me to interpret them briefly. And um, here are some of the answers that they gave me when I asked them about um, their experience interpreting, what an optimal interpreting experience is, what their mental state is in that when they're there, um, what it feels like, what it feels like when it's going really badly, what tends to throw them off their game, how they get back on track, and how in general, what little techniques they have personally for getting themselves into the right mental state, into that zone for interpreting. So let's give this a try. You know, I went to compile this movie and it was going to take two hours. I didn't have two hours, so you're getting sort of the wrong version here, the beta version. So let's see if we can make this work. with the 
Education booth. I feel like I'm in a zone. Hi. It's a great feeling. <laughs> it reinforces my trust in the interpreter, that's for sure. Because sometimes you just need a, a good speech to make you go, yes, I can do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel wonderful. I feel like I'm opening the world to these people that whose door has been closed. I just feel really bad. I, um, I feel like it's all my fault. I'm, I'm very nervous. So when I interpret it, my, my voice might um, not be as smooth or might not sound as natural. Um, and then in, in the inside of my head, I'm getting frustrated because I'm not getting the full message of the speaker. So I'm, I'm worried about uh, how the listeners take this message. And if they don't get it, I mean, it, I mean, it's true, it got and got us out. If I don't understand, I can't really make our my listeners understand. So, all these things are going on in my head. That's the awful, you know, state. <laughs> it depends on the day. Sometimes it's like, oh, well, this is so well. And other times it's, I can't speak French, and I probably shouldn't do this, and I should probably just go back to working at Victoria's Secret. And... <laughs> <laughs>
articulate. <laughs> So it concentrates on refining critical aspects of your performance so as to master tasks that you couldn't reliably perform initially. If you're a student here now, you're experiencing just how intensive such practice can be, the kind of concentration and purposefulness that it requires. But practice <coughs> cannot stop once you pass your professional exams here at MIDS. That's just the beginning. It's a well-established finding in expertise studies that it takes approximately 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become an expert. Depending on how many hours a day you practice, that's about 10 years. And here's the really, here's the really big news. All that practice and experience actually changes your brain both physiologically and cognitively. <coughs> Expertise in interpreting researchers such as Ensley, Horn, Masunaga, Shallard, and our very Minwai Yu, whom you saw um, in the video, have shown that experts perform at a superior level, expert interpreters that is, well, and experts in general, not because they're smarter or even have better general memory ability but for the following reasons. They're able to instantly perceive patterns and cues that novices miss altogether. They extend or circumvent the usual limits on working memory. They have better selectional abilities. For example, they're able to naturally zoom in on what information is relevant and disregard what's not. And they're able to manage their attentional resources more efficiently. Ensley, in 2006, identified at least four changes that take place that make <coughs> experts' cognitive processes more efficient and more effective. These include enhanced perception, so the ability to perceive task-relevant information because they know what cues to look for. Secondly, Mental models. They develop mental models of different subject domains. This helps them to instantly classify, integrate, and appreciate the significance of new elements of information. Also, experts have schema of prototypical situations. That is, they instantly know what to do uh, in that situation, how to handle it, because they've seen it before. And so they can kind of run that script. Some uh, expertise researchers, like Klein, call this recognition-primed decision-making. The fourth mechanism that enables uh, experts to perform at a superior level is automaticity. Things that may require your full attention now, like note-taking, like remembering terminology, and so on and so forth, can, later on, through much experience and practice, be performed almost without conscious thought. So, experts have it easy. 
experts are able to perform more effortlessly and thus relax into a state of broadened awareness, which in turn can lead to better anticipation, ever more refined performance, intuitive action, and novel insights. As Feltovich, uh, Priatula, and Erickson say in their, stu in their ex studies of expertise from psychological perspectives, experts have all the time in the world. <coughs> He also said this, I love this quote, experts fail grac uh, gracefully, novices crash. <laughs> <coughs> Meanwhile, novices have it hard. In expertise, talent, and social encouragement, Earl Hunt says, it's harder to become an expert than to be one. I'm sure you can all attest to that. So, all of this illustrates the well-documented theory of brain plasticity. This doesn't mean that we all have cheapo plastic brains. It refers to neuroplasticity. That is, the fact that experience changes the brain. This is a really important fact to know. Researchers like Carol Dweck at Stanford University who study theories of motivation, which is a branch of cognitive psychology, have determined that when it comes to intelligence, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who believe that intelligence and ability are fixed, i.e., you've got what you've got, and that's it, baby. You know, either you're smart or you're not. And those who believe that intelligence and ability are malleable. That is, they can change with practice and experience. As it turns out, these beliefs and incidentally, the latter is true. It's been shown empirically that intelligence is malleable. It does change with practice and experience. It but it turns out that these beliefs that we hold have real consequences on performance and motivation. People who believe that intelligence is fixed, so you feel like, you know, I'm just as smart as I am, and there isn't really a whole lot that I can do about that. Such people tend to have performance achievement goals. That is, they feel that how they, well they perform shows how smart they are. How well they perform shows how smart they are. So, if they perform well, they attribute it to the fact that they're smart. Everything goes swimmingly. But if they perform badly, if they experience failure, they attribute that to how not smart they are. So they, these people tend to focus a lot on grades, on making sure that they do better than other people, because this is a validation of their intelligence. In the face of failure, they tend to lose interest and motivation give up, stop trying. They avoid the challenge because they don't want the risk of failure, and they don't want to risk feeling like they're not so smart after all, or risk other people forming that opinion. They feel helpless. Nothing I do will help anyway, so I guess I just don't have what it takes. On the other side, people who believe that intelligence is malleable believe that they their intelligence and their ability can grow. And so they tend to hold what's called mastery achievement goals. They may not want to, they undertake things because they want to learn and get better at the skills they're trying to acquire. So they're willing to take on challenges that will help them do that, even if it means experiencing more failure, not doing as well as others who seem to have a natural ability. Malleable intelligence believers tend to have hardly, tend to have much more hearty intrinsic motivation. That is, within uh, motivation that's within themselves and doesn't depend on external rewards and recognition, like grades. They also tend to have more perseverance, a certain resiliency in the face of failure, because what matters is the learning. This is possible because, fundamentally, their sense of self-worth isn't so contingent 
on their performance. They can have a bad day, and it doesn't flood them with self-doubt. Dweck and her colleagues have found that people who believe intelligence and ability are malleable tend to improve more over time and take greater enjoyment in what they do. Interpreting programs do a great job of teaching effective techniques and strategies. How to learn what you don't know and prepare for an interpretation. How to listen and how to process what you hear. How to take notes, how to split your attention, how to monitor your output to ensure that you're not talking nonsense. If you're a TNI student here at Ms., you probably feel new syna synapses like that firing every day. But you know, I remember going through school and how much I suffered. I'd be trying so hard, concentrating so hard, and still too often, my mind would go blank, or I'd get things jumbled up, or I'd get behind and miss things because I'd get flustered and start grasping at words, unable to relax and let the speaker's basic points sink in. Still today, I sometimes suffer in these ways when I'm interpreting. And year after year, I see students suffering similarly. So it seems to me that such struggles often arise not so much from a failure to learn proper strategies and techniques, but from those underlying abilities we examined earlier. So let's look at those again. Here's a cleaner list that's a little easier to read. Focused attention, sustained attention, attentional control, so being able to recover from distractions, for instance, emotional self-regulation, when you're feeling the performance anxiety, not trying to block it out, but being able to acknowledge it and not have it undo you, but potentially even work for you. Also, enhanced perception. If any of you have seen uh, the Sherlock Holmes movie, you know that slow motion where it's kind of like he sees everything, how it's going to happen? In expanded time, that's what enhanced perception feels like. So just imagine how awesome you'd be if you spent a whole interpreting class in this kind of state of mind, in this state of being. But you know, we just talked about how many of the underlying abilities come only with extensive practice and experience. So where does that leave you if you're a student? And how can we teachers help if the problem is deeper than the technique? If it has to do with a student's state of mind and ability to focus their attention? In short, I've begun to wonder, is there anything that we can do to smooth and shorten the road to expertise? So, I think that that something, maybe, might be mental conditioning. So, imagine a soccer player. A soccer player, somebody who wants to be a really a great soccer player, might know fancy footwork, know how to strike the ball, know how to hit it just right so it checks into the top of the goal, but you know what? That person still is not going to make it if they're not in top physical condition. Because when push comes to shove, they're not going to have the speed. They're not going to have the strength. They're not going to have the resiliency to actually pull it off. And this is true um, even in the military. So Stanley and John in 2009, uh, performed a pilot study that they called Mind Fitness and Mental Armor, Enhancing Performance and Building Warrior Resilience. So, where did this come from? There are signs that military troops are experiencing more stress and strain than ever. The highest desertion rates ever, suicide, post-traumatic stress syndrome, su substance abuse, divorce, murder, violence. 
30 to 40 percent of returning troops report mental health problems. So the military wants to cultivate mental agility and adaptability in troops so they can handle the stresses and potential trauma of today's complex and unpredictable missions. They also want to cultivate balance and non-reactivity so they can navigate morally ambiguous situations. They also want to cultivate attentional capacity, self-awareness, and situational awareness so they can make good decisions in a distributed operations structure that pushes decision-making responsibility down to junior officers. Are you noticing the connection with interpreting? Stressful, complex, unpredictable, sometimes morally ambiguous, when you know that what's happening is going to put somebody away in jail for life and maybe they're not understanding fully. Decision making, all of this. Implementing what they call mindfulness-based mind fitness training, or MFIT for short, um, this is what they did in their study. And this was techniques and exercises shown to be effective in civilian populations for mental agility, emotional regulation, attention and situational awareness. Importantly, these exercises appear to achieve improvements in mind fitness by changing the structure and function of the brain processes so that they're more efficient. The authors say that their pilot research conducted by <coughs> pre-deployment marine reservists suggested that MFIT exercises um, was similarly successful at boi bolstering mind fitness and building resilience against stressors in a military cohort. It was they it's what they call stress inoculation. They say, with physical exercise and repetition of certain body movements, the body becomes stronger, more efficient, and better able to perform those movements with ease. A similar process can occur with the brain, with the engagement and repetition of certain mental processes the brain becomes more efficient at those processes. This improved efficiency arises because any time we perform a physical or mental task, the brain regions that serve task-related functions show increased neuron activity. Over time, as we choose to build a new mental skill, the repeated engagement of the brain regions supporting that skill creates a more efficient pattern of neuron activity. For example, by rearranging structural connections between brain cells involved in that skill. In other words, experience and training can lead to functional and structural reorganization of the brain. Thus, there is a profound parallel between physical fitness and mind fitness. If you're interested, later this week on the website, uh, for the Founder Translation series, I'll be uploading uh, that article if you'd like to read it in full. Let's talk for a moment about stress. Stress is produced by real or imagined events that are perceived to threaten our physical and our mental and or our mental well-being. They're often thought of as being caused by events or circumstances that are external to us. But stress is actually a perceived internal response. Now the right amount of stress can actually enable us to have a peak performance. But if there's too much, the biological and physiological effects of excessive stress can be actually quite uh, negative. Stress, too much stress, reduces our capacity to process new information and learn uh, trauma. Uh, uh, trauma and stress lead to deficits in cognitive functioning. In a large study, it was shown that soldiers deployed in Iraq uh, could, perform, uh, could perform more quickly. They had faster reactions than other, other soldiers, but they did significantly worse when it came to their ability to focus, their verbal ability, and their spatial memory. 
Also, too much stress can make us more reactive and emotional in our decision making. So, managing stress is a really important key factor. There's this great uh, quote back from 1959 um, by Panic, who said, interpreters insist that they must be allowed to smoke even when the audience is prohibited from it. There are other indications that their nerves are in the kind of state in which by additional, any additional strain would prove unbearable. So, stress and stress management is a key ability to being a good interpreter. So, what are the kinds of exercises and techniques that we're talking about? The approach taken in the military study um, is based on mindfulness, or what researchers at UCLA are calling mindful awareness practices. So, in this case, um, it was a short eight-week program with 30 minutes of practice a day. The exercises were exercises that build concentration by focusing on one uh, object of attention, such as a particular body sensation. Secondly, exercises that build situational awareness and non-reactivity through wider attention on internal and external stim stimuli. And thirdly, exercises that use focus attention to re-regulate physiological and psychological symptoms that develop from traumatic or stressful experiences. So to give you a sense of the kinds of exercises that have been empirically shown to improve the kinds of cognitive abilities and affective qualities that we've discussed today, um, I would list just a few of them for you. So, exercises that build focus of attention. Typically, from a mindfulness approach, this would be simply to focus on one's breath. And every time, like in a sitting quietly, or walking, even. And every time the mind wanders, you don't go, oh shoot, I'm blowing it. There's no self-judgment, but just, oh, my mind wandered, and okay, I'm gonna come back and think about my breath again. So just that repeated practice of coming back to an object of attention. Why the breath? Well, it's always with us, right? And so it's always there. It's something you can always focus back in on. It can also be an external object, like a candle or a rock or anything for that matter. Or it can be a sound. So in a meditation environment, that's often a bell. Um, because of, it's a bell's particularly nice because of the long reverberation that lasts for a while. Situational awareness and non-reactivity might be approached through an exercise such as, in the same situation, this time pay particular attention to thoughts and emotions that enter your mind. Noticing that? And then again returning to the object of attention and continuing to repeat that. Or noticing physical sensations. And again, returning to the focus of attention. Or noticing sounds, people, conversations around us. And then returning to the focus of attention. It's that learning to re-shift uh, our focus. Let it go wide, bring it back in. Another one might be called reframing, to get at that emotional side of things, of being able to regulate our emotion. And one thing, one approach to this that uh, I've just been experimenting with in interpreting class actually, is invoking in your mind a negative emotion that you, tend, you personally tend to have when you're interpreting. Whether it's anxiety, whether it's frustration, or what have you. Evoking that until you can feel it. And then reframing it, such as if you're feeling embarrassed about making an interpreting mistake, letting, noticing that feeling be the cue to remind yourself, it's not about me. Or, that's okay. If it were easy, I wouldn't be learning. And once you feel that shift, in your mind and in your body, then 
you're just returning to the object of attention, like your breath, kind of a rest. And then doing it again, evoking that negative feeling again, shifting it, and then coming back to rest. So then it becomes a kind of habit. So then when you're up there in the inter interpreting booth and you make a big old fat mistake, instead of beating yourself up for it and missing the next minute of what comes, instantly that feeling of frustration at having made a mistake is your cue. You'll automatically remember, oh, that's okay, I'm learning, and get back to the object of attention, which in this case is what the speaker is saying. So here's one diagram uh, that illustrates uh, such an exercise. This is by Arthur Zedjong, who teaches uh, physics at Amherst College, and also is uh, one of the people who works within the Association for Contemplative Mind in Higher Education. So this illustrates this practicing repeatedly shifting back and forth between focused attention and open attention. Focused attention open attention. The purpose is to pra purposely practice shifting one's attention back and forth. So remember how deliberate practice is a key to developing expertise. These same underlying abilities, <coughs> focused attention, receptive awareness, non-judgment, not only of other people, but especially non-judgment of ourselves um, are really key to supporting that deliberate practice. Because when you go to do intensive interpreting practice, you need to be able to really focus. You need to be able to be there without judgment and get into that same zone that some of our interpreters so wonderfully describe. And that's how you're going to get the most out of your practice sessions. You put in a lot of time already. And so if you bring yourself to those practice sessions in this kind of focused state of mind, you'll get a lot more bang for the buck, as they say. You'll get a lot more out of the time that you put in. So I'm beginning to experiment with such exercise as a kind of informal pilot. But I have yet to explore other possible approaches. Um, other kinds of exercises from cognitive psychology, for instance. I also haven't yet empirically tested the effects of such conditioning for student interpreters or compared the relative benefits of different possible implementations. Like, well, is it best to incorporate such exercise directly into the interpreting classroom? This was the approach that Stanley and John took with the soldiers. Um, in that case, exercises were incorporated into physical training and other mission essential tasks and were completed during the duty day in groups or individually. Another possibility is to have a, a set program that's co-curricular, so outside of regular classes. Another possibility is simply educating interpreting students, like I'm attempting to do today, about the benefits of mental conditioning, of paying attention to the malleability of our intelligence, and then making them aware of resources that are available in the community, just as there are here at the Monday Institute. There are meditation groups. There's yoga, even right over here at the sports center and all sorts of other places. And of course, there's the Pacific Ocean, you know, for uh, really uh, going out for exercise and walks and whatnot. Whatever it is that helps you just really get into that space. So, that's for the future. That's what I hope to uh, orient my research toward. But meanwhile, if you came today hoping that I would give you lots of really concrete things to do, even though this isn't really a workshop, but more reporting of research, I'd like to give a few suggestions of what you can do for yourself. So, the first is breathe. <laughs> I learned a really great thing listening to Forum on KQED uh, last uh, Wednesday when I was driving down here. 
It was an interview with the dolphin researcher, Diane Rees, who's a professor of cognitive psychology. And she uh, informed the listening audience that dolphins are voluntary breathers. What that means is that dolphins don't breathe automatically, like we do. It's not an automatic, autotomic system. They have to think about it. They have to do it intentionally. So I would say become like a dolphin. Become a voluntary breather. Do it intentionally. And this isn't just touchy feely. <coughs> Remember, they're teaching even soldiers to do this. And soldiers are not touchy feely. Okay? So what are the benefits? Because one, it focuses your attention. Secondly, it calms you. You breathe, if you're nervous and you're breathing shallowly, and then you purposely take a nice, full, deep breath that oxygenates your whole body, it physically and mentally calms you, which is exactly what we want when we're in stressful interpreting environments. Also, well, let's talk about that oxygen hormone. It gets the oxygen up to the brain. So it makes you more able to perform those cognitive tasks that are so difficult. Also, for your poor audience, breathing helps lower your voice so that you're not screeching in people's ears and sounding all stressful and getting all up time because he's going too fast. Blah, 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 blah. You know, instead, breathing helps you bring it down and your audience will be grateful and they won't be ripping off their earphones because they just can't stand it anymore because you're giving them a headache. And incidentally, it's a virtuous cycle. The dropping of your own voice will reassure you and build your feeling of competence and confidence. If you sound calm and confident, you will be more calm and confident. Oops, what's that doing there? We already did that. Um, that's fine. So, Another thing, self-care. This may seem banal, but it's not. Another article that I'll be putting up on the website is Holly Mickelson's recent great little article in the ATA Chronicle called, Want to Improve Your Interpreting? Drop that donut and grab a jump rope. And she reports about studies on neuroplasticity and the effect of what we eat. So get sleep, eat right, exercise, and go for balance in your life. Don't burn out by just working all the time. Also, read. Find out more. Some of the studies referenced today will be posted on the website. And for translators, those of you who were so kind to come even though you were doing translation and not interpreting, I'll also put up there my recent article, The Mindful Translator which sort of relates to all of this as well. I think I have a couple more slides of just closing, but I'll hold it there because it's time for question and answer. Um, and we'll be sure to, we'll do it Oprah style, bringing around the uh, microphone so that our interpreters can hear us on top. Any questions or comments from you? Thank you very much. I just came to the United States and want to apologize. My English is so bad. So, um, uh, Professor Johnson, I think it is a very, very interesting presentation because uh, it is not very often that you are able to hear uh, about mental conditioning. Uh, so, uh, I did also some research in Russia on mental conditioning and I would be very, very interested in learning about uh, the results of your uh, presentation, the results of your study. For example, in uh, one of the papers that was, pu that was published, it was said that you can never get rid of stage fright. And stage fright is always going to be there, it is always going to be um, something that is uh, going to be there for the interpreters and translators. But on the other hand, it is very interesting to compare uh, the peak of stage fright for amateur and for uh, professionals. 
So the um, one of the researches that I read uh, was that um, for M attacks, the peak of stage fright is several minutes after the beginning of the interpretation. For the professionals, the peak of stage fright is several minutes before the beginning of the interpretation. So I would, very, would be very, very interested in learning about uh, your studies and maybe you can come with some kind of sets of objective criteria uh, to compare the performance, the stage fright, stage anxiety of uh, students and professional doctors. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'd love to hear about your research and also to get my hands on that article. Um, in fact, for a paper I'm doing this semester, and if any of you have things that you need to tell me about this, I'm all ears. Um, um, in my motivation class, I'm going to be researching what can we do, especially for interpreting students, to help build resiliency to failure, right? Because I know what it's like, I've sat where you're sitting, and there were days where I just went home and cried because it felt like, you know, no matter how hard I was trying, I just kept hitting my head against the wall and nothing was ever good enough. I mean, eventually it was, right? But there were days when it just felt like nothing was good enough. And how do you build the resiliency to push through that, right? So this is one focus of my research right now. And if anybody has input, um, all ears on performance anxiety. This is exactly right. The performance anxiety does not go away. Even every interpreter I speak with still experiences performance anxiety, even if they've been doing it 10, 20, 30 years. But the thing is to get it to work for you. And actually, that performance anxiety can be a really good thing. What does it do? It gets your adrenaline pumping. And that, if used well, can really focus your attention. I have to say that I experience this most acutely in depositions. Because I know that they're like a pack of wolves in there, ready to rip at each other's throats. And they are both going to try to use me, the interpreter, in that game. And they're going to try to rip to shreds what I do. And I know that I've got about five minutes to prove my competence to them in the opening minutes of that deposition in order to gain their confidence. And so, you know, I feel like a prize boxer ready to hit the ring and go in there and show them what I can do. And it's the anxiety, really. It's the jitters that helps me really gather that energy and, you know, come in punching. Um, one of the articles that I'll upload is one done on uh, performance musicians called Silent Illumination. The study was a little weak in some ways in terms of its validity and reliability, but really interesting uh, findings nonetheless that um, they did this really cool thing where they had students in a music, performing music program. They made, they had control and a treatment group. Uh, so the treatment group got, I can't remember how many weeks of uh, meditation training, and then there was the control group. And then they all, one criterion is they all had to give a public concert in solo. And at that concert, there was a jury who didn't know who was the control and who was the treatment or anything like that. And their job was to objectively judge the quality of the performance of each participant. And meanwhile, also, um, just before and after the performance, there was a little survey of the students reporting how they felt and how nervous they were. And interestingly, there was no correlation between how nervous they felt and how, and the quality of their performance. In fact, some of the people who were the most nervous performed the best. The difference being that they didn't beat themselves up because they were feeling nervous. They just noticed because of the training, the mindfulness training, they went, oh, I'm nervous, okay? And went out and did the job they had to do. Instead of, oh no, I'm so nervous, that means I'm really gonna mess up, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! Right? They had learned how to manage that. 
And so it didn't impinge on the quality. In fact, sometimes they did even better. So thank you for bringing that up. What else? Yeah. Actually, the, <clears throat> the question I had is that with the research that you've done, have you looked at any of the research that's been done, particularly with regard to distracted driving and multitasking? Because as I've looked at some of that research, it's been interesting to see that what they say flies in the face of one of the models that we have used over the years to teach interpreting, and that is that you have to split your attention where the body of research when it comes to distracted driving and multitasking indicates that the brain can't split its attention but simply is able to switch really quickly between them. And should that have an effect on the way that we teach interpreting and the fact that there are several tasks that we have to keep track of uh, virtually at the same time? Thank you. That's a really interesting question. And um, I'll approach it in this way. Uh, first of all, what you're saying about multitasking is absolutely true. And this goes to what I was saying before about learning to be aware of and be in control of that switching of your focus of attention. Right? So it's something that you are able to do not just automatically, but also consciously when necessary, when there are distractors, for instance. But there are super interesting studies about driving. The interesting thing about driving is that it's a completely automatic behavior, right? I can't tell you, you may not want to be on the road with me, but I can't tell you how many times I go from point A to point B and I don't know how I got there because it was just so automatic. The problem with that kind of automaticity is that um, we miss things, right? Because we're going on autopilot and we see only what we expect to see. One of the terms for this is um, uh, attentional blindness. So, there's a really famous clip, maybe I'll try to find this when you can put it up, it's hilarious, where um, uh, the researchers, this was I believe at MIT, they um, told participants in the study, watch this basketball game, and there are some people who are bouncing white balls and other people who are bouncing black balls, and it's something like, I want you to tell me how many are doing how many white and how many black there are, or how many times they bounce the ball, or I can't remember what, something like that. So that's the task given. And what they do is in the middle of this game, they have somebody in a big fat gorilla suit go traipsing through across the court. You know what? I don't remember the numbers. Most of them didn't even see the gorilla. They didn't see it. They say, no way. And they had to see the footage. They said, oh my god, there is a gorilla. Because they were completely focused on something else. So one of the big dangers of being an expert is that we go on autopilot. It's one of the downsides. You get really good at something, you don't think about it too much anymore. You just go along, right? And that has really big dangers because we can miss things. And what they've found is that um, continuing to do deliberate practice, even when you're an expert, is really important to counteracting that automaticity because we're purposely reflecting on our practice, reviewing it, seeing where our errors are, and so on, so that we don't just fall into that kind of blindness in our practice. Um, so I don't, I mean, there are a lot of studies out on attention split, um, especially for simultaneous interpreting, and I haven't looked at that body of the, the research too much yet, but if you're interested on in that, there's a pile of papers. I hope that 
in a very oblique way, addresses some of what you brought up. How's our time? A few more minutes? Five minutes? Anybody? <coughs> Um, as a TNI student, we are trying to do more practice, but there's so much information, you also just recommend that we must read more, that we try to read more. But is there any good guidance or suggestions when we start? What, like after all, you can't be like an expert in every aspect. So do you recommend that like, you focus on some areas? Mm -hmm. What kind of material would you choose to practice as a first year student? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I should first of all just clarify that when I said uh, read, um, what I meant was if you are interested in the kinds of things I've been talking about today, there are really interesting papers and studies and whatnot on that. And so you can start with the things that I'll be uploading. So you can find out more about it that way. But you raise a really interesting and important question. Um, the question was, you know, we're already so busy trying to practice as much as we can, and we know we're supposed to read, but gosh, where do we start and what materials do we use? First of all, I would say, ask your professors, right? What do you feel this week would be the kind of thing for this exercise or this kind of practice that would be best for us to work with? And also, if you're working in practice groups, which I hope you are, Share around the burden, right? Week to week or practice to practice session, a different person bringing the materials so that you're not spending all of your valuable time just sifting through piles of potential materials. I know how much time that can take. But another really important aspect of effective, deliberate practice is, as I said, reflecting on what you've done, right? which is why Professor Harmer assigns journals, writing your interpreting journal, and why the analogous mechanism that I use is what I call a, a practice session debrief form. But for a, an, an effective, deliberate practice session, you want to already come to your session with the materials you're going to use and with some objectives in mind. Today, I'm going to work on this. If it's um, making, having cleaner notes, or getting the big idea, or just working on the numbers, or whatever it may be. Um, and not spending the first 20 minutes or half hour of your practice session fishing around for something to work with, for, for example, but coming ready to work. And then, um, before you finish your practice session, taking the last five minutes or so to review what you did, whether it's looking back through your notes, listening to the recordings, what have you, and judging, well, how did I do? Was it accurate? Was it complete? How was my delivery? And so on. And thinking about what you did right, that you were happy about, that you want to try to emulate in your future practice, because a certain strategy really worked for you. And on the other side, what really hung you up? What didn't work? and thinking about strat new strategies that you can employ to try to fix those problems. And the beauty is that if you do that at the end of each practice session, right there, you have your objectives for your next practice session. You have already articulated for yourself the strategies that you want to experiment with to see if they work any better. So that through trial and error, you refine your technique you reinforce what works, and you change what doesn't. So, um, one other thing that I would mention is if any of you are in second year, uh, you probably have um, the uh, Contemporary Research on Interpreting course this semester, and I imagine that there's some kind of little research paper uh, required in the context of that class. And if so, consider if you're interested in this aspect of things, maybe you might do a little research in this vein. Um, it could be very, it's one possibility.
Also, I'm not alone. There are a few professors on campus who are kind of exploring in the same direction. And um, it would be interesting for us <clears throat> to find out about what each other are doing. Like you said that you've done research on mental conditioning in Russia. And so um, I would invite any of you who want to, to just email me. Careful, there are a couple of J.E. Johnsons here on campus, so be sure you get the right one um, when you email me. And I'd be really interested to hear what you're doing or what you've been exploring. Um, also, if you're doing any research or you know of somebody else doing research in this area, so that we can begin to coalesce a community of practitioners and researchers who are interested in this, what we might call mindful interpreting, perhaps. I don't know. The other thing is I'm continuing to collect interpreter experiences. And I found it so rich interviewing uh, the few that I had a chance to interview. And if you uh, feel like you wouldn't mind being interviewed in the same way, I'd love to hear from you just to enrich that uh, body of uh, qualitative input. So thank you for coming and for your attention. Thank you again, Matt. Thank you for this fantastic presentation.